today I want to, um, to build the lecture in the following way because we have not so much time. I want to go um, a little bit faster uh, through the theoretical material because this you can check also uh, taking uh, the, the, the transparencies. And then I will show you uh, two more files, uh, at least four files, not two last, like the last day. Um, uh, so that, that you get a more practical impression how this is working. So when um, we ended up uh, last uh, time when we said we have a shallow uh, deep network. In the shallow deep network this is missing. Yes? And we had only weights for the connections between the input and the units of the hidden layer and the units and the output layer. So, uh, now, for the reasons uh, that I will uh, tell you later, now we will introduce additional layers. We have, we, if, this is layer, if this is layer with index 0, this will be the layer with index 1, the layer with index 2, the layer with index 3, and the output layer will have the index 4. Um, it is not necessary, it is not necessary that these different layers which you are introducing have the same number of units. But all these layers will work with the same activation function. So if you design for this layer, for example, that you will work with ReLoop, it's fine. But then please, in all, in all of these units, and if you decide here to work with tangent hyperbolicus, also fine, but please then use it everywhere. So, and uh, just for the notation, we will put the number of the layer here in, in this practice. So, if we have, again, we have the same, we have the same procedures. We have the forward propagation, then we are looking to the error and the output, have the backward propagation, update at every, now at every layer, our weights and our bias, and then we are, have the next turn for the forward layer. So it's going forward and backward. So as you see, as you see, <coughs> This is coming from the input. This is just for this small uh, neural network. We are multiplying. Uh, uh, we are multiplying our weights with the output. From this, sometimes x is also named like a at layer zero. Of course, this is the output at layer zero, and plus the bias. And this we gave give to the activation function and get this output. This output then is used again in the second layer. And the procedure is going on. Um, yeah, up to the, the third layer and at the fourth layer, finally we are getting the estimation. And this estimation we are comparing with the label. So, um, yeah, in this slide, the important thing is just only here. This is the, for these are the formulas which we will use. And you see, in that case, I can also work with matrices and vectors, because these are the weights of layer LL, and in the columns are the weights for each connection, okay? And A L minus 1, this is the output from the previous layer, but already as a vector. And also the bias uh, here, the bias on, on layer L, we are using as a vector, so that the output is also a vector, and we can use this vector then on the, um, on the activation function at layer L. This means, again, it's not necessary to work in the loop, we can do it faster, in the most of the languages faster, with um, matrix or array operations. Okay. Yeah, this we discussed already. 
um, to the question which I touched before, why we are using deep representations. Let me explain this um, at least on two examples. When we want to teach a, a computer to, to view, so that's a thing what the computer can't do in a simple way. For us as humans, we are learning that in our childhood and then we are able, of course, in a longer learning process, but to classify, to predict, to recognize, a computer is not able to do so. But what he can do is learning from very simple things, from very simple things to more and more complex ones. At that level, we are only recognizing edges. What are horizontal edges and what are vertical edges? And based on that, we already um, combine some kind of edges. We are getting some uh, bigger. We are getting some bigger picture. And last but least, we get something, some like something like that picture, and then we can try to classify. This picture. The same thing is also uh, when we use uh, deep representations for audio. So, if a spoken word, then of course we have vocals on the level of audio vocalization. Then we are coming to phonemas like cat, and later we are coming to words, and last but least to sentences and phrases. So also the computer deep learning representation gives us the possibility to start from very simple input and go and get more and more complex representations. That's the idea behind. Of course, there are also other ideas behind. Um, um, this idea I can show here. Yeah. If we are looking to an XOR function, and it's only, not only two uh, inputs, but let's say n inputs. Of course, you can use an XOR in a, a shallow network. And then you have all your operations, all your operations you have in one layer. But this means the uh, number of operations is 2 powered by n minus 1. But if we are using, if we are using, um, a deep representation, then uh, uh, the order of um, of our of our com uh, computations is, is in the is in the order of log n. So this means we need less computation time, or let's say okay, less uh, less operations. And this is also a reason to use uh, deep learning or deep uh, deep representations, because for very very big data sets, of course. Uh, if this is very very high, your n, you can you can um, imagine that this takes a lot of time and a lot uses a lot of computational um, power. So and in that case, we can reduce it. This is also a reason. This is also a reason for for the use of deep learning representations. This, but this means uh, as vice versa that of course many things what we are doing with deep learning we could do also with a shallow network. The question is only how big is the computer which you have and how big is the, uh, <coughs> let's say, the team which can work on that to uh, implement it. So, until now it seemed so that uh, Deep, uh, deep networks and um, uh, shallow networks is more or less the same, yes and not. Um, to implement, to implement um, a deep learning network, it makes sense to work with caches. So this means we are going through this layer always in that direction and then back in that or that or that direction. So, and something what we calculated on this path of calculation, concrete our set, we can also use in the backward propagation. 
So uh, in many cases, in many cases, it makes sense to uh, put this this uh, value in the cache and then call it on the cache on at the, at the time when you are going back. So at layer L, what we are calculating when this is the input, we are calculating the new weights. Uh, we are calculating, we are working with the weights and we are working with the bias which are given, sorry, they are given at that time. And we are calculating this output. And this output is going to the next layer. When we are coming back, then we have the change of A at layer L. And using this value which we calculated at that level, using uh, the weights and the bias, we call this from the cache and then we can also calculate the set and also um, the weights and the bias is, is always given and we can call we can call that and we can calculate that and that. So this means this um, reduces this reduces the number of computations and uh, eases the algorithm. So in, in, in a lot of implementations of um, of the backward function, you will find that. What makes this concrete? Concrete, it means that we should have, um, last at least, two representations uh, and two functions. One function at the output layer uh, a representation because the calculations at the output layer are a little bit different because here we are using our DA is uh, the difference between the prediction and the label and this is different how we are calculating then uh, DA at that level. So we are implementing one function for the or let's say one pair of functions for the last layer and then um, a structure which we can use more or less at every layer. And then now it depends only from the layers and you are going on the, in one loop upwards, in the other loop uh, downwards, and then, then it works, hopefully. The most... The biggest problem let's say in the implementation, the biggest problem in the, implementation, in the implementation is always to have the right shape of all your, of all your values. Because you will see will, this will be uh, matrices and this will be arrays with uh, three-dimensional arrays and four-dimensional arrays. And this also happens with me that I'm implementing something and then I see it's not working and the, the um, <coughs> The program answers me, shape is not fitting. And then you have to think at which place you put not the right indices. So this means uh, it makes a sense, I say it's before you before you are implementing to think also about the shapes of the inputs and outputs which you are getting and to go through the whole algorithm, forward and backward, that this is always fitting. And then hopefully you get the right answer. <coughs> so the implementation of the backward uh, algorithm, as you see, is uh, more or less uh, the same as we had this already for the uh, for, for the shallow network. We have our input DAL, which we have got from the from the previous layer. This is the calculation from the previous layer. And now we want to calculate this output, this, the changes in the weights, and the changes in the bias on layer L. And the formulas for that is we are using, we are using uh, <coughs> this DAL, for this you can introduce that, with uh, multiplication element-wise of the first derivative of our um, of our activation function and based on that we can calculate the changes in the weight, the changes in the uh, uh, in the bias on layer L 
And last but not least, as an output, also the changes in the A for the previous layer. Of course, we are going back. So, and this, these things then, um, or we store at least in the cache, in the cache we store that. And in the cache, of course, we have our weights and we have the bias in the, in the cache. And we have also these, these, uh, these values also in the cache. Um, if you remember when I spoke about um, uh, logistic regression, I mentioned that we have parameters for the programming. In our case now, we have not only parameters, we are working also with hyperparameters. Uh, the parameters, uh, uh, the parameters, this is what is that, um, really changing uh, or is running in the program. But with the hyperparameters, we can, we can now um, influence the performance of our algorithm. One of the most important parameters, as I said already, is the learning rate. Also the number of iterations, number of hidden layers. And somebody asked me yesterday about uh, does it matter how much hidden layers I have and how much units I have. Uh, of course it matters uh, on the computation time, and, but also it matters on the, uh, let's say, on the uh, accuracy of the output. I will show you later uh, at least some architectures and you will see the authors played, they played on the, on the dimensions, on the filters, they played on the dimensions on the different layers, just to get the wanted output. And of course also the uh, choice of the activation function. Uh, what I am not, uh, there are also other hyperparameters which I don't mention now, because two less time. We, are, we have something what we are calling momentum, Momentum is something that is coming from numerics. It is an improved gradient algorithm. Gradient, you, you remember? Gradient descent. We have the gradient, we're using the gradient descent to calculate the derivatives. And um, sometimes this is not converging so good as we want. And then an improvement could be done, for example, with the momentum. With the mini batch size means that we from uh, we we say okay we want from uh, from let's say thousand example by 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 chance we are choosing we are choosing only a sample of hundred so the mini batch size but the choice is done by is a random choice always always you're choosing from uh, from your results randomly hundred for example and you run this hundred. And uh, regularization is also um, a technique which we can use to avoid overfitting. All neural networks, and especially deep learning neural networks, are prone to overfitting. Uh, so uh, it makes sense if, if you have the feeling that your uh, algorithm is not learning to use some kind of regularizations. There are different. There are different kinds of regularizations. You can find this in the literature. The most common uh, regularization is, um, is a quadratic regularization, yeah? which is uh, based on, 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 a, on the Euclid measure. So quite often this is discussed, um, especially for people who uh, have no deep knowledge in deep learning. Uh, if you read something in the, uh, in the, in, let's say, in the newspapers, in the journals, or some philosophers, then they say, oh, this is very, very dangerous, and um, in, in the next 50 years, the robots will command us, and so on. If, um, let's say so, um, this is not only my point of view, and I'm now uh, I'm using um, Android. A, a method of, uh, of of proof, which is called the authority method, 
you are, you are calling authorities. Um, of course, for deep learning, for deep learning, there are some similarities with brain activity. For example, as I showed you for the for the computer vision, that we first learn uh, what are the edges, and based on the edges, we are building more and more complex um, complex pictures, or let's say a representation of the picture. This is um, a, a way how also our brain is learning. Because normally we are starting from a simple one and then we are getting more and more complex. So, but nevertheless, our brain doesn't have a relo activation function. It has not a tangent hyperbolicus activation function. And later you also will see it has no convolutional layers. It has no uh, padding and, and so on and so on. So we can say, yes, the idea going from the, from, the, from the simple one to the more complex, this is really taken from, from the way how humans are learning, not only humans, also organizations. Yes, uh, yes you remember I, I mentioned in the beginning, um, two days ago, uh, a definition, or let's say a question from Tom Mitchell, where he said, there is a question, what are, what is similar in learning for computers, for humans, for organizations, for animals, and so on. And this is something, what we really use. But in general, we should distinct, and this is my, in this I'm very, very convinced, with a so-called general AI, which really, uh, artificial intelligence, which would be able to replace our brain activity. And that's what we are doing now. Let's call it AI in a narrow sense. It's not a really nice term, but I, I also have nothing else. Uh, I took this from Andrew and uh, but also uh, Kang Fu Li, who is one of the Chinese leaders in AI. Uh, he uh, is supporting the same point of view. <coughs> and he distincts between four waves of AI. An internet-related AI and the business AI, which are always running, yes. If you go to the internet, make your click in Amazon, somewhere the computer says, aha, uh -huh, user Andreas, he wants to see shoes. Next time I will show, you, show him all brown shoes in the size of. Of course, I was looking for that. It might be, maybe I will be not today, but tomorrow I will buy them. And also in the business AI, business AI is, of course, um, on the one side, this has to do with the production. Um, we are doing a lot now to connect uh, our production via this the buzzword Industries 4.0 uh, with different, let's say, um, network-based operations and not only the production, but all the business, the business structures, they are trying to introduce some kind of automatization in that. Fine. I don't know um, how, the, how is the situation in, uh, in Armenia, but I can say that the expectations in Germany are very high, and not only by the big industries, but also by the small and medium uh, enterprises. There is a report from uh, last year, or 2017, from SAS. Uh, it's in English, by the way. Uh, and they, they have, they did a really deep survey, not only two questions, but uh, this, the, the discussion of the survey is about 50 or 60 pages. And they, they really asked where you will use this, where are your expectations, what really works, what doesn't work, and so on. And uh, most of the companies uh, expect that they can improve their inner organization. They are not expecting so much to improve the sale, but the inner organization of a company, this is a high expectation also from the, from the uh, point of view of the medium. Uh, the medium-sized companies, the problem is they have, there is a lack of specialists. By the way, but this is not uh, special for Europe, or this is not special for Armenia. If you go to the US, also lack of specialists in this area. So, <coughs> we are now at that stage, at perception AI. 
we want to understand how our senses how our senses are working and how maybe maybe we can replace some in some places our senses with artificial intelligence so this is what we are doing in computer vision this is what we are doing in natural language processing that what we are doing in let's say the um, classification of sounds uh, I until now I didn't read anything about the perceptions uh, of our tongue but maybe this will come um, and um, haptic perceptions these are also already they are started uh, to, to try also to, to apply this to haptics but this is very 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 uh, let's say difficult and let's say the uh, the overall the overall AI and that wave this is autonomous this means this autonomous driving autonomous swimming autonomous flying autonomous production everything what has to do with robotics we have mostly in this area so this um, these are the waves which are expected this is going on this will uh, I think this will be the next 10 15 years and autonomous AI also about the next 20 years uh, have you already autonomous driving on on your streets in no, no car no bus <laughs> introduced. We haven't good roads, enough good roads. Uh, I, I think they are, they are not used to the way how the drivers are driving here. <laughs> this needs a, a hard learning process. <laughs> okay, but nevertheless, nevertheless, I um, put it here, um, uh, Germany's re-engineering of brain. Uh, the American Academy of Engineering put it challenges for the 21st century and re-engineering of the brain. This is one of the, I don't remember, 49, don't ask me how much challenges they put it, but this is one of the big challenges what they expect with what will be solved during 21st century. But where we are now with deep learning, this is maybe one two percent yes and i those i see at least for not only for my generation but also for your generation i see no danger that you will be replaced by robots <laughs> by the way if you go uh Kaifu, Kaifuli, um he um he published a book about the power uh, about china as a power in ai and um, he is describing also, or he may, is making a discussion about which kind of jobs really will be replaced. Mm -hmm. yes. So if somebody is interested in that, I really can um, say go to this book because it's, uh, it's about, he has a big experience and is based, of course, also on statistics. So. I think that uh, the general problem of uh, general AI is our computational power, which is now so strong. So uh, we can get uh, enough results from our uh, theoretical knowledge uh, to get the right way. Uh, I guess that uh, uh, in uh, USA uh, there are already quantum uh, processors to do computational uh, work and. Uh, that is million times faster than our uh, normal computers. I have a good friend who is in close connections with, on the one side, with uh, Microsoft, uh, especially with supercomputing, and on the other side, but he's working in the area of algorithms. And uh, he, um, he always emphasizes uh, it is good to have big computational power. But this will be not enough. This is a is a necessary condition, a necessary condition. But a, a, a big computational power by itself will not will not produce brain activities. Yeah, the, it will not, uh, the, the, the computer will not arrange the connections of the hardware and software inside automatically in such a way that it's working like a brain. For this, we need much more insight, much more understanding about how a brain is working, and 
as I see the literature now, we are still at the beginning. But uh, again, I agree with you, it's a big challenge. But I see another problem, uh, let's say one lesser challenge. To work with supercomputers is one fine thing. Can, but can, how can we break this down that we can just do this on the level on the chip so that you can put this in a car, so that you can put this, let's say, in a, on the street light or so on. This is by the example in one of the directions of Microp in which we are working. We try, uh, we try to break down the algorithms to a level that it can, can work at least at Raspberry Pi. Um, enlarged, or let's say, uh, or with a stick which is now uh, produced by Intel. And this stick is uh, special for, it's called Movidius, it's special for, for machine learning applications. And uh, we, for example, tested it and found out that um, a normal YOLO algorithm or a NASA algorithm which uh, you use for object detection, not for the object classification. This is a different things. Um, but for the object detection, it works in a yeah, in a way that you can have a movie and it picks out the car and follows the car with a Raspberry Pi. But a Raspberry Pi alone is not enough. There's the power to this. Of course, we, we should train the algorithm. And this you can, of course, not do on a Raspberry Pi or a smaller computer, or we have smaller computational units. But it's again about yeah, the energy which you do, which you will use it as a possibility. So let me close this. to uh, special networks. We have now deep learning networks, but these kind of deep learning networks have one problem. I will not call it a problem. Of course, everything what we see in the sun so we call it a problem. The uh, people in Japan call it a hope. <laughs> Different way. <laughs> <coughs> we have our units, let's say so, yes. And The layers are fully connected. And if the layers are fully connected and you have a lot of parameters, this also brings you to the problem that you have uh, too much computational operations. So one way uh, to um, uh, work on this is to specialize the architectures. Uh, let's say in convolutional networks, recurrent or sequential networks, and other networks. Uh, <coughs> this means we are designing the network now for special kind of applications. Maybe it is possible to transfer later, maybe for example, the convolution networks were designed exactly for computer vision, but now we see this with convolution networks we can also solve other problems. But uh, nevertheless, uh, <coughs> the computer vision was the first, was the first uh, uh, problem. So what means computer vision? On uh, the one side, the computer vision means we need an object classification. Yeah, and this cat or not cat, we discussed this already. Uh, OK, this is the object uh, classification. Uh, uh, this is the object classification. Is this uh, Lee or not? Uh, coming to a door, looking at the door, and the door is opening if your face is recognized. Uh, you have this now on every, on every uh, Apple computer, uh, sorry, Apple phone. So also my Apple phone is looking to me and say, today you're looking great. I will allow you to, uh, <laughs> to use me. <coughs> but another, another way is to, to do the following. This is a style transfer. Where you have, for example, this style from Picasso, 
and to transfer this style for to, to this picture. So this to this photo will look Picasso like. Uh, you can go to the internet, there's a, a link, uh, it's called Dream, Deem, uh, Deep Dream. And there you can even upload your own photo and see, and, and choose a style, and then see how the, what the, how the computer sees you in the style of Monet, for example. <coughs> so this is another way of computer vision, uh, and then, of course, you see it here. Yes. This is this picture with that style. And the third thing is what we quite often use for autonomous driving is uh, object detection. So it is detecting the objects. And then um, we can improve even these kind of algorithms in such a way that not only the object is detected, but the object is also classified. Uh, that's Really, that uh, uh, the, co the computer say this is a car, and uh, in that case only cars were detected, but we of course can also detect trees. We can uh, detect pedestrians uh, and so on. And then for uh, autonomous driving, it's a difference of if you have beside you a bicyclist or a pedestrian or a car. So, how this is working? It is working, as I told you, uh, the computer vision is starting with an edge detection. And we are looking for vertical edges, and we are looking for horizontal edges. The edge detection is nothing new in image processing. We have a lot of algorithms uh, in image processing. We, we can try, uh, where we uh, can find out what are sharp edges in which direction and to, um, to locate them. The idea behind is always to use a filtering. And filtering is something uh, what we call from a mathematical point of view, this is a convolution uh, operation. So this is the reason why these are called the convolutional layers. The, uh, the great thing is to have the right weights in the in the lay, uh, in the filter, the right numbers for the uh, for the filter. Of course, the, uh, in image processing there are let's say predis, uh, predefined predefined uh, values, but in our case, uh, the computer should learn. We should learn these these uh, the weights or the uh, which we are using in the filter. This is the way how this is, what, what we are doing last and least. So I will not go uh, through now this, there are a lot of uh, slides about filtering. Um, but you see, our filter, our filter is going, is going uh, over, always three by three, and this is a size of filter which is quite often used. It's going through, uh, through your picture. These are the pixels. These are the pixels. So the filter has a three by three uh, pixel filter, <coughs> and this is just, and then uh, we have a convolution. We multiply this in the convolution, and we get an output. So, um, but there is one problem. The problem is the following. When we are doing the filtering, then of course the different pixels, or every pixel has an influence. But the way how the pixels have an influence is different if your pixel is inside, when we are working on the pixels. If the pixel is inside the picture or it is here, at the first row or uh, first column, the f first or the last row or the last column. So this means in that case we, uh, we reduce the uh, influence of this pixel for the output. And what is done? 
we are adding we are adding uh, a raw uh, a, a column we are adding a column in the raw with zeros this is called padding normally zero is used uh, for padding because we need only the position but we don't need the value so multiplying with zero gives you zero <coughs> and you can uh, calculate for example if in that case the padding is one but it is not necessary that you have only a padding of one. You can also work with a padding of two. It's up to you. Uh, but, but which results are better? So if you want to uh, calculate the output without padding, you can always calculate uh, the number of pixels in a row minus the number of pixels uh, in the filter uh, in the, uh, in the row uh, plus one. And then you are doing this for uh, for the for the first and the second dimension, and then you get the dimension of the output. If you are using a padding, you can use this kind of um, uh, this kind uh, of formula. But these formulas are only applicable if our filter uh, if our filter is moves always one pixel side uh, one pixel in this, this direction and then one pixel in this direction we are now calling this the stride and if normally in our formula here this should be divided by the stride but if the stride is one you don't see uh, this this number So, um, we are distincting between two kinds of um, convolutions, uh, convolutions, and this you can call, you can call this in algorithms. If, the alg if in the algorithm you say padding is valid, then there is no padding. If you say uh, it is the same, then you should, uh, of course, say how big is the padding, but uh, then you are using um, uh, the pad so that the output size is the same as the input size. Yeah, about stride I spoke already. So the change of the formula is just only that we are dividing, that we are dividing by um, uh, by s, and it's a floor around. Everybody understands what's the floor rounding? Floor seal now? Not really. Uh -huh. <coughs> you can round in four different ways. You can round then if you go to plus infinity. So this means if you have a number 2.8, then the next integer is straight in the direction of plus infinity. Uh, <coughs> you can, um, you can, um, uh, around also in the direction of minus infinity. Uh, in the case of a positive number, this is the same like floor. Of course, you are going from 2.8 to 2. But for minus, uh, for minus 2.8, uh, if you are if you are around in the direction of minus infinity, you're going to minus three. But if you are going in the direction of zero, and that's what's uh, uh, what floor is doing. It's always rounding in the direction of, of zero. Then uh, you're getting uh, minus two. So the first, uh, the, 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 the rounding in the direction of uh, plus and minus infinity, we're calling seal. seal. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to zero, it is floor. And if you just only want to, the, the rounding rules which are used uh, in mathematics or what you learned in in the school, then say around. But in that case, we always round in the direction of zero. This brackets means that. But if you implement this, uh, for example, in in a, in a language, in a programming language, and you use Flua, the programming language will understand. I think it's more of a language barrier thing. 
Sorry? I think it's more of a language barrier thing because um, we, of course, in, in the school, back in the school, we all learned this, but because of the language difference, it kind of sounds ah, like Ah, okay, because of that, yeah. Uh, the, but the English expression is, is fluency. If, if you go, uh, for example, yeah, uh, are you using MATLAB? Uh, I'm using uh, JavaScript and Python. Uh, Python and Python? It's, also it's called Floor. Uh, it's yeah. Floor, yeah. Floor yeah. and, and Seal. Mm -hmm. And Round you find also. Yeah. So, now we are coming to the next question. If we are speaking about images, then we have uh, three different channels. We have the red channel, we have the green channel, and we have the blue channel. And of course, when we are now uh, working with filters, then also we should apply the filters in these different dimensions. So this means uh, when you find a graphical representation of um, uh, image processing, or let's say deep learning Im image processing algorithms, you will find this always in such a representation that they say, okay, you have this as the size, as the size of your uh, of your image, and then you have as much or the volume of this uh, bracket uh, is as much channels as you have, and of course you also can play on the number of channels. This is also an idea. So so we have a third dimension. And this is the reason why I said we are not working now only in matrices, we are working, working in arrays. And always the, uh, the shape of the array is a very, very, let's say, tricky thing. And uh, quite often you make the arrows in, that, in, that, in this area. <coughs> so for example, uh, we have this, we have this uh, input, we have three channels. We are using uh, we are using this kind of filters, this kind of filters, and then in the output, in the output, we are getting also we are getting also something like um, uh, uh, like the volume. Of course, it depends how much filters you are using. It is not necessary to work with the same uh, with the same size of the, of the channels. So if we hey, let's say have uh, RGBA, mm -hmm. then we're making a four-dimensional array. Actually, yes, you are making a four-dimensional. <coughs> but sorry, uh, in this case you need to use the three. Yes, in that case filters, I need to yeah. use this, the same. The you same. mean the number of these three filters you yes. can change? But if you have more, if you have here more filters, uh, let's say more dimensions, or you. Uh, more, more filters, uh, uh, sorry, and more channels, more channels, then of course you also can, you can work here with more channels. <coughs> so which kind of layers we are using? Uh, about the convolutional layer, we already spo uh, spoke. Um, another kind of layer which is used is called the pooling layer, and the pooling layer is just to reduce the sample size. Uh, the learning process is going on only on the convolutional layers. On the pooling layer, we are learning nothing. So there is no parameters to train. It is just to reduce the sample size. And we have fully connected layers. And in the case of fully connected layers, of course, you have a lot of parameters to learn. But these are the uh, different layers which are used in, in, a, in, a, in a convolutional network. And now the combination of this uh, different, uh, let's say, <coughs> layers is, is important. Sometimes you have two convolutional layers, then after that the pooling. Um, uh, I've didn't mention here that uh, that you also have uh, sometimes a normalization uh, operator normalization layer and the last or the last two layers normally are fully connected layers uh, maybe I missed the first 20 minutes of the I'm, I'm a bit lazy I just woke up so late uh, maybe I missed it but how's the pulling down 
the pulling will go to It's like no, 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 I will show you the pulling. Oh, okay. So the pooling, uh, you can do the pooling in different ways. This is, uh, let's, first of all, the idea of a pooling is to reduce the size of the representation and to make the features, or detect the, the features which are more robust. This is what, what we want. So, and <coughs> in that case, we say we have a filter size of two and a stride of two. So and now we are going to that, to these here, to these, uh, these pixels, and say this is the pixel with the maximum, and the result will be nine. Then the stride is by two, by two, and we are in this in this area, and take again the pixel with the maximum. It is not necessary to work only with the maximum. You can also work with an average, but in the case of an average, you get ratios. Yes, and this is sometimes a problem of course you can get around but uh, the let's say the the practice not from a theoretical point of view but from a practical point of view max pooling is more used now than average so we take uh, an array uh, of four by four yes for in this but you can also three by three take yeah as well. we take an n by an array yeah, yeah. and we basically decrease it by a fourth of two right power of two so no, yeah, yeah, power, if, if this is a power of two, then you will reduce it by yeah. power of two. Yeah, that makes sense. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> if this is not, if this, uh, but normally this is a power then, of two. Then it makes sense pulling. Yes. Like yes. make a pull. Yeah, make a pull. Yes. Yeah, right. That's the idea behind. So we, you see, these are the more these are the more robust uh, parameters than these two parameters because the, the value is higher. And averaging will be used for another more specific test? Uh, for, other, for other applications, but uh, as I said, averaging means that you, uh, that you get the ratios. And uh, first of all, uh, we try to work with integers. And the second is um, the, uh, the results with average uh, pooling was, is, uh, for, this, for the architectures, which I will show you, is not so good. They tried it also with average pooling. But they decided that max pooling is the better way. So, <coughs> but average pooling is, of course, it is not forbidden. This is just try it. Uh, one question. Yeah. Uh, in this case, you you lose some information. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking for the more most robust because I want. I, I'm looking for for the features which has the most robust. Or in this case, the highest the highest uh, values inside. Yes, of course we are losing information. But are we doing this because we want to do less computation or? Yes, or uh, yes, yes, we want to reduce, we want to reduce the size of representation because the last layers are fully connected layers and then you get a lot of parameters. Let me finish that and then we are coming to concrete examples. Uh, this is the average laying layer, for example, yes. So, <coughs> and uh, these are the hyperparameters which you are using for the, for the pooling. Um, normally for pooling you are use no padding. The important thing from the point of deep learning is no parameters are learned. We are just taking the maximum, we are just taking an average, but we are, don't really uh, try to, 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 to improve it. Of course, if you put pooling, it depends only what, what were the values in the previous layer. Uh, why we are skipping the padding on the pooling in, layer? Because uh, it prints nothing. Especially if you have a maximum pooling. Oh, so like you can have a maximum value on edges? Just yeah, have yeah the maximum between 2 and 0 is 2. And our values are positive. Right, makes sense. So we uh, always do pulling uh, uh, when we use some filters, so we can uh, make pulling. Uh, yes, of course you can do it. The question is, makes it sense? 
This is one thing is the formal, yes, formally, yes. Uh, but you always should think it makes it sense to make a pooling at that at that point. Uh, it's better to speak about concrete architectures and not just in in an open space. So this is, for example, a network um, a network uh, which is uh, was developed from Lecun. He is one of the giants in machine learning, and uh, he this, uh, developed this network already at the end of the 80s, uh, 89, I think it was. It, uh, this, this, this is already adapted because, for example, Kuhn, uh, LeCun was working with average pooling. And the idea where he had uh, used it for what he used it was the uh, recogni recognition or the classification, let's say, of handwritten ciphers to recognize on the post office the zip code in an automated way in the US. If there is a database which is called MNIST, uh, you find it everywhere on the internet. And uh, by the way, they have a new one, MFashion. <laughs> Not to work only with MNIST. Um, uh, and, um, uh, you can you can try it by yourself. You can find that this algorithm, uh, the Likun algorithm, is MNIST ready for, for use, ready for test. So the idea is, this is uh, my input. It's a handwritten cyber, yes, um, with uh, 32 by 32 pixels. Um, in that case, is is RGB, uh, RGB, uh, uh, but it's not necessary. You can you can also work with gray value. A little bit reduced, the results will be more or less the same. After that, you are applying a first convolutional layer. Um, the filter is uh, five by five, and the stride is one. No pool, uh, no padding. Um, then you apply a max pool with two by two. Yeah. Sorry, how did it become from RGB to six uh, layers? Uh, now, now it's an image, 28 by 28 by 6, right? The second, the second uh, step. And this is the whole point of network. Uh, it makes like lots of layers. Oh, I'm kind of new to... No, no, I also should now calculate this. It uses six filters. You can change. Oh, uh, oh, oh I, I think I got it. All right, yeah. uh, I got it. So, and then, then you, apply, you apply the first pooling layer. So the pooling layer has, of course, the same number of channels, but you see it is reduced. And then again, again, uh, this is, let's say, layer one. We have uh, first uh, first convolutional and the first pooler pooling, and this we can combine in one layer. Then again, a second convolutional layer, which is now reduced uh, to 10 by 10, but 60 channels, and a max pooling. Again, uh, where we get where we get a reduced image five by five, and after that, after that, this is enrolled in one vector, and to this one vector, we are applying two fully connected, uh, fully connected layers. But the fully connected again, we reduce here from four hundred to one hundred twenty. And from here to 884, uh, and then to 10. Of course, ciphers we have 10, so we have 10 classes. And for the output, for the for the classification on the output here, we are using a softmax, not a sigmoid. The sigmoid, as I told you last time, sigmoid is only used uh, if you are classify. With, um, uh, uh, if you have a binary classification. But if the classification is a multiple classification, we are using softmax and not speaking about the formulas, but about the, uh, the idea. We are, choosing, we are choosing the label with the highest probability. Uh, you, you are getting numbers which are, you can interpret like probabilities and uh, the label with the highest probability is the predicted label. So, so this is uh, one of the 
classical architectures which, uh, which are used. And uh, if you make a benchmarking, for example, it makes sense also to work with that architecture. <coughs> Yeah, the question, why convolutions? The reason for, uh, the convolu for using convolution layers is to reduce the number of uh, number of parameters which we should have. If uh, if we are speaking about if we are speaking about the computational size, because here I have to train uh, 28 by 28 to six. This is 4,704 parameters, and if I'm going down, 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 then I have less parameters to train. And the second reason is, the second reason if, if you are using convolutional wave layers, you hope, this is a hope, that some results, uh, inter intermediate results, which you have during the computation, you can reuse. And this makes also sense, this is a sense to work with uh, convolutional layers. If you have fully, if you have a fully connected uh, network, in that case, we will have 14 million parameters to train for a fully connected network. Yes, 32 by 32 by 3, and uh, then um, fully connected with, with that, and then we get so much. The second thing is the parameter sharing. Uh, you see, um, we have here, if we, are, if we are making our, our, our convolution, if we are making our convolution, here we are getting a zero, and uh, for that we are getting 30, but this, let's say, this structure is repeated, so, and in other places, we can use the same values. Mm -hmm. This is also this, that we have this, this uh, parameter sharing, this is also, let's say, a reason to use convolutional networks, and not, not fully connected networks. Is there a way where we should use fully connected instead of convolutional? Like, it's more preferable to use fully connected than convolutional? Let's say so, if you have not too much parameters, of course, it makes sense to work with fully connected network because you are not losing information. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, as you saw, uh, even in the Likun architecture, at the output we are using fully connected network and uh, fully connected layers just to uh, work uh, to get, let's say, the classification last at least on the fully connected layers. But first, we try to reduce the parameters. Mm -hmm. So, if you see, as you see, we can now put everything together. We have a training set uh, with pictures, with labels. We train, we train our algorithm. We train our algorithm on the number of uh, pictures. The number of pictures, maybe fifty thousand, maybe hundred thousand. These are really good uh, numbers already. And for that, you need, of course, a little bit computational power. I agree. I also bought a better computer now, because my computer was not enough uh, to work on, on such uh, applications. And then we apply, apply the network. We spoke about that. And then we have the fully connected layers, the fully connected layers just to uh, make the prediction. And always, um, we calculate for the backward, uh, for the forward and backward uh, uh, um, algorithm. 
which is of course much more complicated now than in the case of a normal, of a normal uh, fully connected uh, network. We apply a cost function, which is the sum over the losses. And we uh, should use some algorithm to optimize the parameters. Optimizing the parameters means to find the minimum, a minimum for the cost function. Uh, which kind of algorithm you are using for the, uh, for the optimization? This is a little bit a test. You never can say in advance uh, for a given set of data which kind of optimization algorithm works best. Normally, you start with a gradient descent. You play on the momentum. And if this is not working, then you can go to other algorithms in the libraries. A lot of algorithms are implemented, so it's not necessary to, to uh, let's say, to program your own optimization algorithms. But another optimization algorithm, which is quite often used, is we have gradient descent, we have uh, stochastic gradient descent, and Adams. an adapted algorithm, but it, it, it sounds good, Adams. <laughs> uh, Adams, of, for example, is also a good choice. So I would always work in, in that direction. Mm -hmm. Start with gradient descent. If gradient descent it doesn't satisfy you, you can, chase, uh, you can choose stochastic gradient descent. And if stochastic gradient descent is not working, then try Adams. So last but least, yeah, Lena, we already checked. Ah. This is an uh, and uh, this is an, uh, a net, uh, let's say, uh, uh, architecture which was um, developed, as I told you, in 2012 um, for the for the Kaggle competition, of uh, and uh, it's called AlexNet. Uh, it it's used in Alexa, uh, but the name is not coming from uh, from Alexa. The name uh, Alex has to do with one of the uh, let's say, authors, Alexander Krasanovsky uh, was one of the authors. So it's the reason why it's called uh, Alexnet. And they all are, they all are pupils or uh, students, former students from, uh, uh, from uh, Geoffrey Hinton. I, I maybe remember the first lesson I told you, there was a small group in Vancouver which uh, survived <laughs> After all the winter for for um, for neural networks, Geoffrey Hinton was working still on that, and Alexander Kishanovsky is one of his um, um, one of his students. Now, of course, he is also already a well-known scientist in <laughs> this area. So, uh, as you see, uh, this is more complex. This is more complex. Um, it, on the one side, we see the similarity um, to Linet, but it is much bigger, and because it uses it, it uses also convolutional network layers, it uses max pools, and um, then as as they they introduced first time at that time, uh, they introduced uh, the relu function as an activation function. Mm -hmm. Up to that, uh, the sigmoid function was just used. And um, they also uh, introduced uh, normalization. So the Alex network is implemented in most of the libraries. If you go, for example, to NVIDIA and you say, I want to do this with AlexNet, you have nothing to do. You just give your input and you see the output. But of course, you can uh, have no influence on the architecture. You just uh, should take the architect picture as it is, and it depends on which level you are a user. If you are a user, which uh, as a, let's say so, as an engineer, 
you will not go deep to the uh, to the programming uh, part if you are a user as a computer scientist then of course you want to uh, play also here on the parameters and last but least the output the output is um, is done over uh, three, uh, three uh, fully connected layers. They classified thousand classes, not ten, thousand. And the classification was uh, over different uh, objects uh, which you can find on a picture. This is also quite often used, uh, VGG16 or VGG19. Uh, um, uh, it is, let's say, an enlarged Lekun algorithm, uh, this architecture. Um, we tested it, and we have got not so good uh, results. But of course, maybe this has to do with our application. Quite often, quite often, this is used for, for uh, not for image processing, but for for for, for, for video vision, uh, for image vision, but for video vision. Um, the residual networks has to do with um, uh, the following. Quite often in the learning curve, we see the following. By theory, uh, if we improve the number of layers, then the error should go to zero. In the seer, in the seer, uh, in the pra in practice, we see adding layers means you're getting a higher error. Mm -hmm. So, and for this, the so-called residual networks or ResNet uh, architecture was uh, implemented. It has to do with the problem that on zeros we are not learning nothing. And um, the idea of the ResNet is to use this value, add this to that, and uh, combine these two layers. These are the residuals which we are adding here. And in that case, uh, if you are working with uh, residual, with the uh, with the residual, with the residual uh, network, uh, really in practice the error is going is, is decreasing. This is the. Uh, is networks were obtained experimentally, or there is some logic behind? It's got experimental. Okay. Sorry. And how it helps uh, <coughs> to improve training error, this keep connection. Because the point is the point is what happens if you have zeros. And quite often this happens. For example, if you have the log function, there is one minus uh, y hat, and if if, if the if if the prediction is close um, is close to zero, yes, then you are getting a lo uh, logarithm of of one. And this is zero. Yeah. And you're learning nothing. So we are adding some residuals from this point. Yes, we are adding some residuals, and then the value is a little bit uh, far from one. Yeah. Oh, from uh, from yeah, far from far from zero in that case. And the last uh, architecture which I would like to. And how they choose the residuals? Sorry? How they choose uh, which value to add to the If you see that the network is not learning, you just try to. Again, this is this is prepared in, in, in the libraries. You just add it. On a special. Uh, when, when you see that the network is not learning, then you will go through the layers and check on which layer you are not, you are, you are stuck in, yes? And then maybe at that place it makes sense to apply a residual part. Isn't it because in the large dimensions the gradient, gradient is vanishing? Yes. Uh, 
get this one too. So one of the uh, last inventions is uh, called the inception module. Uh, the inception model is uh, coming from uh, the, the, the movie Inception. You saw it? Yeah. Yes. So going deeper, deeper, deeper. <laughs> and um, there is, let's say, the inception. Inception means there are, is some uh, prepared cell of layers which you then combine. And uh, you have the previous activation, from the previous activation you get, uh, you get uh, this input. And you see here you, on the one side, we, you are working with a one-to-one one, one one convolution, a second one-to-one one convolution, a max pool, you get outputs where you're applying these kind of convolutional layers. This was found by experiment. This, it's not theoretically. And you're adding this part from a one-to-one -one con convolution. This is, it looks a little bit complicated, but you can implement it as a subcell and then call it. And then you have the, uh, the channel concat and you reduce the number of channels. So, and uh, normal uh, architecture in inception, or let's say the, the architecture which was used uh, in 2016, uh, in the competition was looking like that. So 21 layers. I you find this picture in the, in the internet. Not necessarily thank you for But it. is that structure fixed like in, uh, in the, no no this is no no let's say so. This structure was used and they won the competition. As I as I told you in, in machine learning the way to work is to work in competitions. Uh, Kaggle or somebody else is opening a competition and then the groups are working to win the competition. It's uh, not only about the, the price uh, which you can get, but it's of course also about the improvements which you are getting. So, and uh, to machine learning, to machine learning or especially also to deep learning, you can have this different perspectives. One perspective which I'm showing now you is uh, to look from the, let's say, from the programming side, from the algorithmic side. Another perspective is to look from a probabilistic side and to look what, which kind of statistics is behind it. Yes. And, but this is a more theoretical, theoretical approach. And a third, uh, a third uh, let's say, a view is from an optimization point of view. If you say, okay, which kind of op uh, optimization algorithms to find the minimum are best to apply under which conditions? This is also not, uh, if you're looking to the structure of the, of the algorithm, you cannot answer to this question. Because the <coughs> every D cell, every D cell, is using is using uh, their own optimization algorithm. Like you can switch from gradient descent to uh, statistic, stochastical gradient descent to uh, to Adams and so on, or to develop your own um, to your own optimization algorithm. Because it's not necessary that during the whole algorithm you are using one and the same one and the same um, optimization algorithm. But can you go back to the previous slide? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, is this structure fixed for one cell? Like, can we change the size? No, you can you play on the structure. Um. Of course you can play on the structure. But in the case which was, uh, which was implemented uh, in the inception uh, architecture, it is fixed. Mm -hmm. So that you can repeat it. The so optimization problem is also kind of like from the problems we were discussing today. Yes, today yes, so yes, yes. The, the way which which kind of optimization algorithms you're choosing. So this means it's machine it's learning. Machine learning problem. has different, let's say, so perspectives, yeah. and you can look to the problems uh, to machine learning from a statistical, especially from a bias, a bias and statistical point of view. You can look to this from the point of view of linear algebra. 
you can look to this to the point of view of optimization, but of course you can look to this also to, from the point of view of which kind of uh, uh, architecture uh, uh, you are using. Yeah, maybe we should apply machine learning here as well to find out what kind of optimization. No, this is what we did, for example, uh, of course, this is quite hard to implement. It is only the, let's say, the specialist in, in, in deep learning are developing such, such kind of architectures. Mm -hmm. But what we, for example, did, we uh, tried to, to find out which framework is working better. We were working, we, we uh, took uh, nine frameworks, choose from these frameworks the frameworks which were fitting to our parameters, this was CAFE and TensorFlow. And then we tried this on a test set. We always use the same test set of data. Mm. And then we checked um, on two different hardwares uh, how this is working. So this is for our conditions we designed. Uh, we found out, for my surprise, by the way, that CAFE was better working than TensorFlow. A special uh, for higher I, let's say for more complex, uh, for more complex um, um, algorithms. Uh, but maybe, maybe this was a problem. This was a problem of the used hardware. Yeah. If I, I'm convinced, if you if you would use a stronger hardware, that maybe the results will be better. But in our case, this was the result. The learning curve. In the case of the VGG16 uh, algorithm, the algorithm didn't learn nothing in TensorFlow. It learned only under CAFE. And uh, in the case of um, um, in the case of the inception, um, uh, the the training time for inception was about six hours, and the training time uh, with TensorFlow and with with CAFE about two hours. Mm -hmm. It was already a big difference. Of course, you expect the bigger training time. But so, and um, yeah, last but not least, this, you find out uh, for your applications what are the best. And always follow the kid, follow the, the rule case. Keep it stupid and simple. Of course, uh, to make it complex is no problem. This is no problem to make the things very complex. The, 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 the big thing is to work with simple, with simple uh, uh, things and good, uh, get good results. So, I think I should finish here and uh, I wanted to show you, if you want, I still have uh, four. Yeah. Can you go one slide back? Does these layers like have the same size? The the yeah the last one. This you one. mean yes this? No, the next one. Yeah. Do they have the same size? Because otherwise we cannot like some can cut them together. Yes. That, that's what they they have. Let's say the 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 let's say the, the choose of the size one three five and one. This was chosen by a special by by a special let's say. Um, combination uh, for the input for such an input. Okay. This was the input. Yes. You always should, uh, should have a look uh, with what is the size of the data with uh, the original data. But of course you can play it. Only the one by one layer. This is a special layer. This is a special convolution which makes you, which reduces you the number of, uh, you get a lot of channels, but you have only one, let's say, uh, one pixel. No, I mean the dimensions <coughs> should be the same for the last time. Uh, this you cannot change, but here you can try to play. But the, the filter, the filter 3 by 3 and 5 by 5 this is, this is common. Maybe there are different strides parting. So the output dimension is 28 by 28. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there are different size of filters. Yeah, this so yeah, this is the, the idea to combine to combine different size of filters.
So we will see what is working. So this is just an example to uh, show how a deep network, but fully connected, can be developed. So and yeah, the. Uh, why I'm using why I'm using uh, this on, on the web? Uh, of course, I need some test cases and some utils, uh, which is quite hard to transport, um, especially in Colab. So I'm using another uh, environment. Uh, so the we are starting with the initialization. And uh, you see the initialization, for the initialization we said we will use random numbers for the weights and we will uh, use zeros for the bias. So this is a way how you can uh, uh, initialize it. And this is the concrete initial initialization. Um, if, the different, um, uh, if the result is different, this can happen, of course, it depends on the, also on the computer which you are using, because you set the seed, and the seed of your, on your computer and the seed of the origin can be different. So, but because this is the same environment where it was developed, <laughs> it is more or less the same. So then we are developing um, the last layer. The last layer here is called uh, a capital L, a capital L layer. Yes. And, uh, is that the sigmoid one? Or? I'm sorry? Is that the sigmoid one, the last layer? Uh, yeah. So, um, as I said, we are putting all parameters. We are putting all parameters in uh, some uh, library. So, <coughs> and um, we can call them later also from the library. The library we are calling parameters. So this, uh, what is set in the in the, in the library. Then we develop the forward propagation. The forward propagation is quite easy because you see this is set and uh, this is the, the linear forward. We just calculate our set and uh, put it in the cache. As I said, we will work with cache. And uh, later we should apply to this another function, so the uh, linear activation forward. It makes sense. It makes sense to uh, split it, the, the linear to develop uh, to to split the calculation of set and a, 
uh, because sometimes you will use this in different places and uh, this is quite quite convenient it makes you, it gives you a structure so in that case it is uh, implemented in such a way that you can call the um, activation sigmoid or you can call the activation redo and depending from uh, what you are calling the activation function is applied again but in which cases for example sigmoid is better than random not for the last layer the sigmoid function we are in that says it's up to you to, to use uh, uh, activation functions you want but uh, you will bet get better results if you use the sigmoid function for binary classification in the last layer. Mm -hmm. And in the other layers, uh, something like a tension hyperbolic force or a relu function. Mm -hmm. I implemented here on, only a relu, but you can also implement a tension hyperbolic force and test it with a tension hyperbolic force if you want. But not with a sigmoid, because of this problem of separation which I showed you. Yeah, that's why I was asking, like, why, why, why do we have this sigmoid? Yeah, because uh, at, the, at the output, at the output, we need only a decision between 0 and 1. Yeah, but this is only last layer, right? Only in the last layer, yes. So, and uh, last not least, We of course need also, uh, oh no, this is too fast, I'm too fast, <coughs> yeah, my backward propagation. Ah, this is the, the forward model, and you see, now we are running, we are running this um, uh, over the layers, yeah. Always our previous A is now our, our A which, which is used for, for, the, uh, for, for the next and we are calling uh, depending, depending how you, how you call um, uh, in, in which layer you are, you are calling the different, uh, the different functions. Mm -hmm. So the call for example could look like this. Yeah, this is the test case special test case which is uh, called and in the test case we have two hidden layers and uh, of course at the last for the last uh, we are using the, the, the sigmoid function as you ask. Uh, the cost function is again implemented oh, sorry. the cost function is implemented in the same way as we did already and um, the backward propagation in the backward propagation, as you see, we are working now with the cache. We are taking, we are taking these values from the cache, and for every layer, for every layer, we are calculating uh, the the, uh, the changes in W, the change in the weights, in the bias, and in the previous output, and write it again in the cache. We give this the, the, the necessary, uh, we, we, we have the output and we write it again in the cache. Where is the backward propagation? Can, can yeah. This is the backward propagation. Okay. But this is only the calculation part of the backward propagation. The, uh, So this is how it's activated. And again, depending from the uh, from the used uh, activation function, we are getting also the this in the backward propagation. Because we need the derivatives. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and last not least, everything is put together in one model. We have the dictionary of the gradients, we have the dictionary of the parameters, we are calling everything on every step on the, on the parameters, uh, calculated, run the loop, run the loop. Um, here we, uh, here we, as you see, we run the loop down. This is uh, 
There's my last layer. This is the last layer. This is the calculation for the last layer, and then I'm going down. Updating the parameters, and that's it. So if you run this over one, one model, you can use it. Um, let me show you one application. You should me say if you still have time. So as you see, in that case, I'm working already. I'm working already with with um, uh, with libraries like uh, CPy. Uh, so the not that's not necessary to implement everything. Uh, and from C uh, from uh, from the package PyIL, I'm calling the sub package image, and from CPy, I'm calling the dimensions of images. By the way, this should be changed because uh, uh, Python is changing the versions. Mm. So, um, but in this environment, it still works. The data set is a prepared data set. Uh, this is, and I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just training uh, and uh, classify of cat and non-cat. Zero one. So this is an example of non-cat, and now. As, as I told you, split split the uh, split this in in the train and test uh, 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 examples. We have 209 training examples. We have uh, 50 test examples. This is the architecture of the uh, um, what we use. It's, it's a, a two-layer network. Um, of course, we have this and this. Uh, this layer. So here you see, um, I cannot go through now to, in detail, but uh, if I would run this, this is now calculated, the cost function you're getting always, you should check if your cost function is going down, mm -hmm. if it's reducing. And uh, it makes sense, for example, also to plot the cost function. The plot is implemented in the call and uh, of, of the command. So you, you can see, OK, yes. It seems so that this worker is reading my algorithm is learning. And then you switch to, we have we have accuracy of 0 0.2, uh, so, sorry, uh, 0 0.72. Of course, was only um, uh, one, hidden, one hidden layer. But if I increase in the same way as I did it already, the layers, the number of layers, then uh, of course, I still have misclassified examples. I have misclassified examples, but the accuracy is already of 0 0.8. Because the, uh, the structure of uh, my algorithm. Is, is it an RSS? No, no, this is, uh, this is just, I added, I added uh, two, two more layers. Uh, yeah, I have a question. For example, you mentioned that in case of RSS, the cost function is always decreasing. And how do we know where to stop? Like, is it trade-off between? If the cost function is getting saturated, if you are not anymore uh, reducing the cost, then you are not anymore. You are close to the minimum. Mm. You are at the minimum already, and then it can happen 
if you make too much uh, iterations, it can happen that the cost function is increasing again. Yeah, this is the number of iterations. This is your cost function j. You're going down, and then you say, okay, let's try more and more and more. You hope that's going to zero. No, it's going up. Or sometimes you also have this, this. Also, picture which is possible. Yeah, you had something like that in your uh, first function as well. How, how can and we this explain this? Yeah, how can we explain this kind of behavior? You cannot really, uh, because you should go inside how, what, what's happening with the weights. But it's not always so that the cost function is going down monotonously. monotonously. But as you see, uh, the direction is, is okay. okay. So then I wanted to show you one thing. If you have nothing installed on your computer for working with deep learning, because you need a lot of um, a lot of uh, libraries uh, and, and so on, and this depends from the version, I recommend you to work with Colab. Uh, the only thing what you should uh, what is necessary for that is that you are um, a user of Google, so you are identified in Google. So Google is um, um, is offering for smaller applications, not for big applications, but for small applications for training. It is offering um, possibility. Uh, let me eight hour, eight hour a day. So sorry. Eight hour a day for free, I think. Yeah. Okay. But this is enough. <laughs> this is enough. I, I don't think that you will work sixteen hours. Of course, after eight hours working on a, on, on, on a, on a program. No, it's the eight hours for the running the models. Because I remember one time I tried to run this composition net network, and it took more than eight hours to run the model, and it just like. Yeah, then, then you are doing too much, too much effort. Yeah, I had to like shrink the data. <laughs> but um, nevertheless, it's, it's, a, it's a convenient, uh, for, for smaller applications, it's quite good. So, and. Um, you can uh, you can upload if if you have uh, for example if you have a Google Drive you can upload from the Google Drive uh, your your files and uh, you can also prepare the examples uh, try so it's quite this is quite good and uh, again I think Kaggle also provides GPU and CPU for free. They, they are, they yeah, they are do. offering GPU. They are offering GPU. So I'm, I'm running now all the here. Uh, the I, I will not go through um, because we have not so much time, but. What we are doing now is we are implementing a, a single convolution. We are implementing um, also, of course, a padding. We are implementing um, uh, we are implementing uh, the cost function and the, and the forward pass and the backward pass. The forward pooling, backward pooling takes a lot of time to implement it and. For example, why I'm, uh, I had a lot of problems on my computer, on my uh, problem running with the, uh, with the, 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 the shapes of the, of the values. And the same, this, this is the same file. In Colab it works, on my computer it doesn't work. Until now I couldn't fix why. But maybe this has to do with the version of, uh, of, of Python which I'm using. Or the CPU and GPU also make difference? So, and uh, last not least, we have we have um, a 
convolutional network uh, running. Yeah, I called it running because this was the version that was really running on, on my computers. And then I changed the version of Python. And I had the problems. That's a real problem because TensorFlow also refuses to update yeah, yeah. to a new Python. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> so, but uh, here, here the uh, that's it, the library from the library. It's not so. It's only NumPy and uh, HPyPy. So it's not too much what I need as uh, as a library. And <coughs> And the Anaconda, let me check if this is still working. Anaconda because the new version of Python is not working with TensorFlow. Yeah, I think it works with 3.6.7 uh, at the latest. Yes, uh, but with 3.7, uh, 3.7 is not working with TensorFlow. When you're installing TensorFlow, you're getting a multiple error. That's, that's a problem because then you have to deal with Python, renaming Pythons for different versions mm -hmm. to work. Yeah, that's that's very I tried to use Python on uh, Lambda functions, and that was uh, just yeah, that was horrible. I will try to use an environment where it works. Yeah, it was working on my computer and uh, now I changed the version and because I need TensorFlow in that case to go back to the origins. The good thing is that uh, your own files are saved and you can hold your files. So, um, in that case, uh, the idea is to recognize uh, different uh, signs which you're getting with your hands. Um, as you see, TensorFlow should be used. Why TensorFlow? A TensorFlow is just, um, let's say, a hyper library and a lot of calls are much easier. You should not program everything. But uh, it needs an additional two lessons to explain how TensorFlow works and what you can do with TensorFlow. Uh, but nevertheless, um, how we are working again, 
we uh, call uh, we call our training examples here. But the important thing is the following. If you see, we have five classes. We have five classes, and uh, the, um, we, the, the, the indexing of the classes is done by a vector. So this vector represents class 0, this vector represents class 1, and so on. And because the vectors have only one input, one, and the others are 0, it, you can classify this quite easy with a softmax, for example. Uh, this is uh, the normalization which we are using, uh, the output, and then uh, we are making place, uh, if you are working with TensorFlow, uh, before you start to work with TensorFlow, you always need placeholders. Uh, where in, this means some graphs where you will make, uh, make your computations. So in, this means in advance you have to think, to think what is the shape of the placeholders which you need? So this is an, uh, let's say this is not given by the program. This you have to think about uh, this uh, before. The initialization of the parameters is uh, similar how we did this already. Um, so we are getting, we try to get some initializer. Uh, you see in that case, I'm calling an initializer which is called Javier. But you can also try who, what I called, uh, what I told you yesterday, or some other initializer. TensorFlow already has the packages for initialization of your network implemented. It's just calling. The only thing is, uh, you should give a seat, otherwise, uh, he doesn't know, or the program doesn't know uh, how to start. And then again, we implement the forward propagation. And in the forward propagation, uh, you see, now I can build, I can build the structure. I say this is a convolutional, net, uh, convolutional layer. I give the strides, I say is padding the same, or is padding valid, or something else. <coughs> I, I also define, I define the activation function, which you can call now, and uh, then the max pool, and of course um, Python is, um, is working like um, a program which is uh, running line by line. The structure which you are giving here is the structure of your network. Yeah, finally, you get this, maybe this result. <laughs> uh, but of course, it's uh, also, uh, oh, what happened here? Ah, I, I should run this because I stopped it. I stopped the program. Of course, this takes a lot of time for the, for the training. So I stopped the program. This is the reason for this, uh, for this error. But this is a typical error, me error message which you get in Python. <coughs> but I would, if I would, li uh, would now train this, it takes about five minutes. So. Let's get this five minutes. So this is just a quick overview. This is a quick overview. Um, what are the basics for for um, for deep learning and just um, one specification, but just the surface uh, <coughs> for convolutional networks. And I said now you can also go deeper and uh, check which kind of architectures make sense in which kind of applications. Play a little bit on the, on the files. Um, 
you need for some of the fires, uh, you need special, special, um, let's say packages. But the packages I have at least on my course, uh, so you can download them, and you need to install them. And uh, <coughs> um, another way of application, also for the recurrent uh, networks, which are mainly uh, applied for natural language processing. There is the structure of the algorithms of the networks that are different to these kind of networks. And this, it's also deep learning, but uh, it looks uh, more different. And uh, one of the uh, big differences for recurrent networks is that the units will have something like a short memory. Uh, because in our case, when the algorithm is running through the unit... It's combinational logic, yeah. No, no, the, 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 when it's running through the unit in forward, it's, it's computed and forget, forget. And it's going back, computed, and you forget it. Of course, you can write it in a cache. And, uh, but it's not in the unit anymore. So languages need to understand context. Yes, that's, that's the reason. Um, what we are always uh, doing, we are checking, we are checking, is this word in a context with other words. Um, but you need very, very big libraries. Uh, for example, there is a library of all words in English used in Wikipedia. This, you can download it. I think most people, when they want to get some language references, they just go to Google Books. Uh, and start to print out everything there is. Yeah, to print out, I mean, in that case, uh, to, to, to train, to train, to train uh, recurrent networks for, let's say, uh, for speech to language or for, for, um, for the translation, for the automatic translation, you need a library of all words and how often they are used and in which connotation they are used uh, from, uh, from a source and as a source, and Wikipedia is used. Of course, the, and this means, of course, that because the Wikipedia of, in English is much, much bigger than the Wikipedia in Armenian, I think. Uh, this means, uh, of course, you have a better source file. Yeah. You have this embedded, you can embed this. I think it's also possible to do this for Armenian language. This is not the problem. The question is only how much references, how much data you have inside. Because in that case, it's not important uh, what concrete is written. It is important which word is following or is nearby another word. And based on that, uh, the, the, the translations and based on that, also the speech to language and, and so on, things are done. Because space. Uh, uh, also, you need for, spe for speech to language uh, implementations, you need um, a lot of training files uh, on dialects because different speakers speak uh, the same language in a different way because they pronounce it in a different way. And it's the question how big is your, is your source file? And again, in English, it is much bigger than in German, uh, in German also, but also in Armenian. Uh, because in Europe we have the joke that the uh, most spoken uh, language in, uh, in Europe is bad English. Sorry? It's everywhere, not bad English. <coughs> it's we joke about ourselves. <laughs> Especially. We, we are not, I'm not joking about Indians, <laughs> but I have my experience with people from <laughs> India speaking English. It's actually interesting how Google can train the neural network to not only understand like bad English European, well, European people speak pretty good English if we talk the truth and India too, but like uh, people from Japan who pronounce like, it's not more like Japanese actually than English and Google can still understand it. That's pretty fascinating because uh, the part is how, where do, do they get the data? Like they just take, take people from Japan and say, speak it and write, write down what you're, what you're talking about. I don't know where they are getting the data, but as you see, getting she data. Stopped. This getting data. This is um, one of the most important things, and uh, in in legal and illegal way, 
the data are collected. Yeah, I think Google just has like a sh some shady post place yes, where they keep people and they just sit down and speak to the microphone and write <laughs> yeah. and get food for it. Maybe, for example, they are using uh, they are using Alexa or something else yeah. because you are speaking to the <laughs> and Alexa is listening. Alexa yeah. is listening. Very fun. And uh, what you see, what you hear always or, or or read in the newspapers is Alexa is taking your personal data. I think they are not so interested what you concrete you or me what we are concrete speaking in that room at that time, but they are interested in our pronunciation. They, and uh, as I, I see this with my with my granddaughters, the granddaughters are pronouncing the things in, in English totally different than me, and as my wife. And sometimes uh, I okay, I have not Alexa, I have um, from from uh, Apple. Oh, I think Siri. Yeah, Siri. Apple pad, and Siri. Yeah, yeah. Not Siri, but the the, the, the Apple Pot. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he. The Apple Pot is reacting to me, but not always to my grand granddaughters. <laughs> Maybe the uh, the, uh, the, 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 the let's say the library doesn't know the music they want, but it just doesn't want to play it. I <laughs> <laughs> like your music taste more. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is more or less all. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for the discussion. Um, I hope a little bit I could bring also something new things to you because I see uh, there are different people. Some are prepared, some are totally new. And uh, in any case, uh, you should go deeper. But uh, I wish you success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.